Hello, welcome back to my Moffat rant. We're gonna pick up where we left off and start talking about The Angels Take Manhattan. <sighs> okay, so at this point, I was starting to burn out on Doctor Who. The Asylum of the Daleks was a really bad episode and left a really sour taste in my mouth about how Amy's infertility was handled. We'd gotten a whole bunch of River Song episodes that revealed a lot of information about her and really fumbled her all around, so I was, you know, not being as forgiving anymore. But let's go on. We find ourselves in New York. Rory gets grabbed by angels and is dragged back to the 1930s where he finds River. The doctor and Amy have to find him. There's a guy keeping an injured angel captive, and the doctor and River flirt a lot. There's this whole thing about the adventure being recorded in a book, and they have to not get spoilers because that makes paradoxes. This is the pawn's farewell episode, and it's awful. Like, it makes no sense if you stop to think about it at all. Let's start with the angels. First of all, the weeping angels now look like or can infect pre-existing statues? Since when? They always looked the same before, and they aren't really statues. They are aliens that look like statues when they quantum lock. Except now they also look like cherubs and other statues? And the angels are sending people back in time and imprisoning them to send them back over and over? But why? Why does that work? The angels feed on the lost potential of that person's original life by pulling them back in time. Do they get more time potential or whatever after they have been dropped somewhere? Why don't all the angels do this then? And the Statue of Liberty. We have to talk about the Statue of Liberty because this is just Moffat thinking something looked cool and not thinking about it at all after that. Because one, the Statue of Liberty isn't made of stone. So even if the angels can now infect normal stone statues, why can they infect a copper statue? And the Statue of Liberty is huge. The angels are still quantum locking in this episode. So how did the Statue of Liberty stroll through Manhattan without anyone noticing? And hey, remember whatever takes the image of an angel becomes itself an angel? Yeah, unpin that one. Because there are now Millions? Billions? Of movies, postcards, posters, and tourist photos that are deadly angel bombs. This is like The Ring, except with five billion tourist selfies. Look, it's fine to introduce new information about recurring monsters, but this makes no goddamn sense. And, uh, okay, so at the end, they paradox jump off a building, which does a big ol' reset on the adventure, but Rory gets grabbed by an angel anyway. Why? How? I thought the paradox would poison all the angels and they die. And, and then they see his tombstone, so the doctor and Amy can't go back to save him. Why? You just did a whole paradox thing. Why can't you do another? So, okay, Amy lets herself get pulled back, too, and the doctor can't go get them, because doing so would screw New York up forever because of paradoxes. So, question one. Why can't you go back in time, grab Rory, and then just buy a tombstone to put in the cemetery? Then it's not a paradox. Or just grab Rory, and then when he dies, bring him back to be buried there. That makes at least as much sense as the shit with the robot doctor getting killed in The Impossible Astronaut and the wedding of River Song. Also, okay, so how far does this no more paradox bubble extend? Like, 
geographically, and in time. Can the doctor never go back to New York? What about New Jersey? Why can't Amy and Rory take a vacation, then in five years hop on the train to Philly and get picked up? Buy a tombstone to be placed in that graveyard while you're there. Like, god damn it. I know it sucks having to leave companions, but it needs to make sense when you do it. So. This all highlights a few of the major problems Moffat has with his writing. He's really bad about continuity and following rules. He doesn't actually like killing characters off, but he likes to threaten to, and he really struggles to write women. Like, Moffat doesn't know if a paradox is something that will kill all the weeping angels, except one very plot convenient one and save everyone, or blow up New York, or do nothing? Like, how is saving Gallifrey in the 50th special not the universe's biggest paradox? Moffat is also awful about killing characters. Like, when the doctor declares, today nobody dies, in The Empty Child. It was a beautiful moment, because so often, the doctor can't save everyone. Everybody lives, Rose. Just this once! Everybody lives! That doctor, fresh from losing Gallifrey? Celebrating not losing a single person is lovely. But then it just keeps happening. River Song? Nah, she gets uploaded into the library. The Pawns? They get to live out the rest of their lives in the past. He brought back Gallifrey, which... Uh, and the Master, apparently? Mistress? Missy? Whatever. Also, apparently, he really dragged out killing Clara. I had stopped watching long before then, but you hear things. Even look at Sherlock. Couldn't let go of Moriarty for seasons. Faked us out about Irene. Faked you out about Watson. Ultimately, if everyone is always in mortal peril, but the characters he likes never really die, it kills all the dramatic tension. You can show me Watson getting shot all you want, Moffat. I don't believe you. And women. Moffat and women. We could talk for a long time about all the weird, shitty stuff he's said about women. But for the sake of time, let's just focus on his female characters today. I mentioned briefly that Blink has some harassment as romance stuff. And we need to talk about River Song. Her character just got more convoluted until her first appearance in the silence in the library is nearly unrecognizable. Eventually, she falls into this whole women flinging themselves at the Moffat protagonist and revolve their whole lives around them thing. She goes from this cool time traveler, equal to the doctor, if not better, to just a mess of tired, weird tropes. She goes from super mysterious time traveling badass to literally a baby that the doctor failed to save, whose entire life revolves around the doctor, and she became an archaeologist so she could find him and they get married. Which, yuck? Like, the doctor also met Amy as a little girl, and they make out eventually. Oh, and Clara kissed the doctor too? Which, the doctor did meet Clara as a little kid, too. And let's not even start on Irene, I'm gay, but I'm gonna fall in love with this dude Adler and Sherlock and all the gross there. Plus, this whole thing that Moffat has about girls whose whole lives revolve around his protagonists. Like, Amy's whole life is warped from childhood by the doctor and the cracks in her wall. River is literally kidnapped and brainwashed to be obsessed with the doctor. That's not healthy. 
Speaking of issues with women, we need to talk about the girl in the fireplace. Another Moffat episode where a child who meets the doctor grows up and ends up romantically into the doctor. What the hell, Moffat? Like, for most of these doctor kisses a girl he met when she was a child scenario, they can be explained as less creepy with context, but Moffat keeps writing it. What is his deal with kissing ladies the doctor meets as children? Weird. And Madame de Pompadour definitely counts as entire life gets wrapped up in the doctor thing. And I'm sorry, I know this is a little off topic, but this episode also has the most infuriating use of time travel. Like, Doc, you know that fireplace jumps decades when you use it, so why would you leave her to go back through the fireplace if you just want her to pack for a few minutes? Just wait. Just wait for her to pack, and then go through the fireplace together. Or, I don't know, write a female character who isn't willing to throw away her entire life to get some doctor action. That could work. Is it because man pain is more important than making sense, Moffat? Is it? And okay, let's jump back to the race thing, because we need to talk about the really shitty joke the doctor makes in that episode, right? When Rose tells him that he can't keep a horse, and the doctor replies, but I let you keep Mickey. After it, follow it. Don't approach it. Just watch what it does. Arthur. Good name for a horse. No, you're not keeping the horse. I let you keep Mickey. Now go, go, go! Like, bro, Rose's black boyfriend hanging out is not the same thing as you wanting to keep a literal farm animal on a spaceship. What the hell? And just, uh, Moffat doesn't write non-white people? Think about it, at least in what I saw of his work. People of color maybe show up for one episode, and it's a miracle if they don't get killed. In the Russell T. Davies episodes, Moffat wrote, the black companions tend to get ignored or sidelined. Martha and Mickey barely show up in Moffat's scripts from that era. And Sherlock has its own set of race issues, mostly the use of stereotypes in minor characters. Like, the entire Blind Banker episode is a dumpster fire. Lots of stereotypes running around there. And we haven't even touched Moffat and LGBT plus stuff either, like Irene Adler identifying as gay but falling in love with Sherlock that I mentioned before. I'm not actually gay. Well, I am. Look at us both. And Oswin dating a girl, being described as a phase. And I believe Moffat dismissed the idea that Sherlock could be asexual in an interview by saying it would be boring. And Vastra and Jenny are cool, but then there's this bit where the doctor kisses Jenny against her will in the Crimson Horror, which is supposed to be funny, but is actually gross for several reasons. <sighs> Look, I haven't seen anything with the Twelfth Doctor, and I know that Moffat's run on Doctor Who is coming to a close, so my complaints, based mostly on Moffat's writing of the Eleventh Doctor's run, are both outdated and soon to be doubly so. I'm beating a dead horse here. But there. I deeply hope that the Twelfth Doctor was written better than Eleven was, because all the wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey, nonsensical bullshit was exhausting for me. And I hope the next writer does better. I hope the new companion, who I believe is going to be a black lesbian woman, will be amazing and well-written and respected by the narrative. I want to come back. I want to love this show again but I don't trust Moffat to write it. And whatever Moffat moves on to next, can we please make him stop writing little children as potential romantic partners? It's creepy. So yeah, thanks for listening to this rant. Uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed it, and if you would like to hear more of my rants in the future, please feel free to subscribe. Thanks a lot!